Okay, welcome everybody to our webinar session for today. I'm very happy that we have this great speaker today here, which is Markus Plona. All right, then, um, yeah, I'm very happy to announce our main speaker for today, Markus Plona. Uh, he's a neurologist and studied medicine in Cologne and Vienna and then moved on to Düsseldorf and Oxford to do research and work as a clinician as well. And since 2007, he works in Munich, where he is now the professor for human pain research at Munich Technical University. And there he works on the question how our brain creates the sensation of pain using EEG and non-invasive brain stimulation. And I guess we will learn a bit about that in his talk today, which is titled Insights into Expectation Effects on Pain Using Electroencephalography. And then I would like to hand over to you and I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will start with sharing the screen. Now you should be able to see my screen, is that true? Yes, that's great. And you can hear me well, hopefully. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this lecture here on uh, insights into expectation effects on pain uh, using EEG. And the first question is, why should we uh, investigate at all how the brain serves expectation effects on pain in general and using EEG in particular? And I think we should always ask ourselves that crucial question. And I found the crucial answer when looking at your homepage, which I found quite uh, well maintained. Uh, we must have a clear understanding of the mechanisms of expect expectation effects. Only with this information, we will be able to incorporate patients' expectations into treatments. And I think that's the broader uh, goal. But we need some basic science insights to understand these processes uh, to eventually uh, harness and to eventually modulate these uh, processes. And pain is an excellent use case as also in your CRC uh, um, used uh, to understand, to learn something about expectation effects. And we have learned a lot about uh, expectation effects uh, and the related brain mechanisms, mostly from fMRI and uh, in particular related to pain. We have learned during the last three decades that pain is associated with the activation of an extended network of brain areas associated with different components of pain. And this spatial information can ideally be complemented uh, by uh, the high temporal and spectrally resolved information provided by EEG to understand better what is happening more precisely within this brain network when pain is experienced and when expectations modulate the experience of pain. And uh, many of you probably know that uh, in response to a brief event in general and a brief painful uh, event in particular, you can in principle record by using EG two different types of brain responses. The first one is the evoked potential, uh, which you can see uh, here in the upper panel. Can you see my mouse here? Uh, my mouse indicator, uh, the evoked potential uh, here. Uh, and the other type of response you can record is uh, the oscillatory response uh, shown in the lower panel. Uh, and this oscillatory response is particularly shown by such time frequency representations of neural activity which show brain activity color-coded increases in red, decreases in blue as a function of time on the x-axis and as a function of frequency on the y-axis. So what can we learn uh, then by using EEG about pain processing and in particular expectation effects on pain processing in uh, the brain? Uh, when we analyzed these evoked and oscillatory responses. And I will uh, focus on two very recent studies uh, on this topic performed in our group. The first one 
primarily performed by Moritz uh, Nickel, uh, postdoc uh, psychologist by training uh, from my group. And the second one uh, uh, performed primarily by Felix Bott, an engineer by training and PhD student currently in my group. And only as a side note, the second um, um, study here will receive this year's uh, pain research award uh, during the next uh, German uh, pain meeting. And uh, the work I will show you is motivated by, inspired and informed in particular by work performed also at EUCRC uh, by um, uh, Christian Büchel's uh, group. Uh, he published in 2000, back in 2017, uh, one, I think, important uh, study on uh, Sensory, the effect of sensory information versus the effects of expectations on the processing of pain by using fMRI. And his findings showed uh, a spatial dissociation between brain areas, particularly related to processing sense or signaling sensory information and other brain areas signaling expectations seen here in the lower panel in orange uh, brain areas related to signaling uh, expectations and blue ones um, uh, brain areas signaling sensory information. And we built upon and uh, slightly mo uh, modified but built upon uh, their paradigm to further investigate that topic uh, uh, by using EEG. So uh, we performed also a probabilistic queuing paradigm in principle, a very simple paradigm where we apply a queue uh, here a few seconds before a painful stimulus is applied and the different queues are paired with different probabilities of receiving high pain and low pain, thereby modulating expectations. Uh, of upcoming pain intensity. And after each stimulus, a few seconds afterwards, uh, we recorded single trial pain ratings uh, on a numerical rating scale between zero and 100. And during the experiment, we recorded EEG. And then also very much based on uh, Christian's approach, uh, we uh, hypothesized uh, or predicted different response patterns uh, of uh, brain responses, which are involved in signaling sensory information, brain responses involved in signaling expectations, and brain responses involved in signaling uh, uh, mismatches between expectations and sensory information, or in other terms, prediction errors. The details of these models are not so important here, uh, but uh, uh, these models are quite well established by Christian, and he in turn also built upon other implementations of similar models. So the crucial question then, using this uh, queuing paradigm, using these model comparisons, how do stimulus intensity and expectations influence perception on a behavioral level? Uh, uh, so only as a sanity check, we uh, here uh, displayed um, uh, the uh, pain intensity ratings as a function of stimulus intensity, higher intensity coded in orange, lower intensity in a violet, and as a function of expectation. LE means low expectation, HE means high expectation here. And as expected, when stimulus intensity increases, pain intensity increases, and when we expect stronger pain, pain is uh, perceived uh, stronger. And the model comparisons confirm that a model including intensity and expectations explain the ratings quite well. So far, uh, 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 so uh, expected. So the next question is then, um, how do 
uh, stimulus intensity and expectations influence EEG responses. Which type of EEG response might be related more to sensory information and in particular to the effect of expectation? So we looked first at the traditional evoked responses. You see here such an evoked potential with different components by tradition labeled N1, N2, P2 by their polarity and by their order, temporal order. And here are the amplitudes of these uh, responses um, um, uh, as, uh, and their influences of objective stimulus intensity here and expectations. And what we found was that stimulus intensity influenced these different uh, evoked potentials. But what we did not find was an influence of expectations, which was a bit unexpected. Uh, but we also performed Bayesian statistics, and we did not only find a lack of evidence in favor of expectation effects, but we found evidence against expectation effects on evoked potentials, and model comparisons confirmed that. So that we can conclude that stimulus intensity, but not expectations, modulate these evoked potentials. And uh, this was a bit surprising and maybe also a bit disappointing not to find anything related to expectations. And one explanation might be, uh, is somehow hidden in a recent study published uh, uh, by uh, Flavia Mancini's group from uh, Cambridge. And they performed also another paradigm, a temporal prediction paradigm, where the sequence of, the, of painful stimuli allows for temporal predictions of upcoming pain intensity and thereby forming expectations. And they found that they also did not find an influence of expectations on evoked potentials, but they found an effect of uh, the confidence of predictions or expectations on evoked uh, potentials. And that might be one uh, kind of uh, expectation-related information hidden in these evoked potentials. But hold in mind, uh, they also did not find any effect of expectations per se on evoked potentials. So these evoked potentials appear to primarily indicate sensory evidence, but no expectations. So what about the next response type? Uh, the oscillatory responses I mentioned in the beginning, are these influenced by uh, expectations? Um, so we uh, also analyzed uh, these responses at different frequencies, which you can see here, alpha frequencies, beta frequencies, gamma frequencies. So by tradition, these frequencies are named by Greek letters. And we also analyzed the amplitudes of these responses and uh, assessed uh, 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 possible effects of stimulus intensity and um, expectations on these responses. And to our surprise, we again did find convincing evidence for stimulus intensity effects, but did not find any evidence for expectation effects, but rather evidence against expectation effects on these oscillatory responses. Which is, um, by the way, in line uh, with a, a study uh, from uh, Christian's uh, group published uh, more or less at the same uh, uh, time, also uh, showing stimulus intensity effects here on oscillatory responses. So uh, we have it, regardless of where we look, we always see stimulus intensity effects, but never expectation effects. So we went a step further to look for expectation effects, and this time before the stimulus. Uh, when you think of our Q paradigm, cues form expectations already a few seconds before the stimulus. Can we at least capture these pure expectation effects when they are not yet contaminated by stimulus-related effects 
or pain stimulus related effects. So we looked at the pre-stimulus phase and there we were uh, found some effects here at alpha and beta frequencies when you compare low high expectation um, um, uh, here time frequency representations and that was also statistically uh, uh, very convincing. You find differences on pre-stimulus activity. So there happened something in the brain before the stimulus and we see a behavioral outcome related to expectations, but there's a missing link between this pre-stimulus activity and the behavioral outcome. So where might uh, this missing link uh, be hidden? Uh, but first, only as a side note, that has also been in line with Christian's findings uh, here. But where are uh, where is this uh, missing link hidden? But uh, before we go for this missing link, let's briefly summarize what we have learned from this study. We have learned from this study that commonly analyzed, evoked, and oscillatory EEG responses are obviously more involved in signaling sensory information than in signaling expectations. And we have learned that expectations shape pre-stimulus alpha and beta oscillations. And on a more general level, we have learned that brain mechanisms serving expectation effects obviously fundamentally differ from the brain mechanisms serving sensory effects on pain. And that reminds me of uh, findings uh, from the fMRI world uh, you are probably more familiar with uh, than I am. Uh, here in this uh, meta-analysis of fMRI placebo uh, studies, uh, you, you means uh, Matthias Zunhammer, Ulrike and Thor, and many others uh, have investigated the effects of expectation placebo uh, uh, manipulations, including expectations, on the neurologic pain signature. So a spatial pattern uh, of uh, fMRI responses related to pain. And surprisingly, you can see here uh, uh, and this uh, uh, lower uh, diamond here indicates that there's only a very, very tiny effect uh, on the neurologic pain uh, signature. So obviously what we can observe here using EEG, these evoked responses, oscillatory responses, they can be regarded as a kind of a EEG-based neurologic pain uh, signature, which tells us something about sensory effects on pain, but not so much about um, contextual effects in general and expectation effects in particular related to pain. But let's come back to the missing link. Where are now expectation effects in the brain? If we agree that pain perception is generated by the brain, and if we belief in these expectation effects on pain perception, it should in principle be possible to record these expectation effects. Where should they be if not in the brain? So, uh, but maybe EEG is not the right technique or we haven't analyzed uh, the EEG data properly so far. What might be the case is when recording EEG, we record primarily signals from different electrodes, but these electrodes represent mixtures of brain activity originating from different brain areas. And maybe that blurring of EEG responses might hide uh, expectation effects on selected brain areas. What you can do to analyze that further is then to perform a source space analysis analyzing uh, EEG data originating from different brain areas. And or what could also be the case is uh, that expectation effects are, can not only be found uh, in regional brain activity at certain brain areas, but in particular uh, in uh, the communication between 
these different brain areas. So what you can do to analyze uh, this is perform connectivity analysis. You know that from the fMRI world, in the EEG world, uh, that's even more uh, complex since uh, many different connectivity measures um, exist in the EEG world. So we performed source-based analysis and connectivity analysis um, using uh, one very well-established uh, connectivity measure term, the debiased weighted face leg index. Um, and we focused our analysis on a few regions of interest. You know that the spatial resolution of EEG is limited, so you cannot uh, disentangle uh, spatially disentangle brain activity in a way you are used to it by using fMRI, but you have rather a rough spatial resolution. So we analyzed brain activity in six regions of interest uh, where we know um, or from which we know that they uh, generate uh, are the strongest generators of brain responses to pain. We know that from intracranial EEG recordings, which is the gold standard of uh, analyzing uh, pain-related EEG responses. And these regions of interest included the prefrontal cortex bilaterally, the parietal operculum bilaterally, and the anterior cingulate cortex um as uh, well as the contralateral primary somatosensory cortex so we first then analyzed we asked ourselves might we find expectation effects when looking spatially specifically at these regions of interest but first we checked can we properly disentangle these different brain areas meaning can we record different brain signals from these brain areas. Uh, um, and when you look at these time frequency representations, only as an example here, the primary somatosensory cortex and here the parietal operculum, you see that it's obviously at least to a certain extent possible to record different uh, signals from these brain areas. And then we looked uh, using the same logic uh, that we have used for the previous analyses. We used the same logic to analyze um, uh, uh, then uh, expectation effects on uh, these uh, brain areas. And the results are uh, summarized here in this plot. And I will briefly guide you uh, through this plot. The upper panel shows intensity effects, the second panel expectation effects, the lower panel prediction effects. Uh, the first column shows uh, effects at alpha frequencies, the second beta, the third gamma frequencies. And the colors here indicate uh, the results from our Bayesian statistics. So base factors uh, higher than three are coded in yellow here. And base factors higher than three mean uh, uh, strong evidence in favor of the hypothesis of, for example, in the upper row, the main effect of intensity. And so what we see is in the alpha range, strong intensity effects on oscillatory activity in all brain areas. In the beta range, uh, weaker effects only in a subset of brain areas, and in the gamma frequency range, very selectively effects uh, uh, on the primary somatosensory cortex. So again, we found strong intensity effects. But let's look at expectation effects, nothing significant. And let's look at prediction error effects, nothing significant. So again, when looking at the oscillatory brain responses, also in source space, we do not find any expectation effects on pain processing. So uh, the next question is then, uh, but what about the connectivity effects? So we next analyzed connectivity and uh, the mode of display here is similar to the previous one when we looked at regional oscillatory activity, but now we look at interregional connectivity. 
And when looking at intensity effects, we find a significant change of connectivity between the interior cingulate cortex and the parietal operculum in the alpha frequency band. But more importantly and interestingly, we find now also expectation effects. Expectation effects in the alpha frequency band between the bilateral parietal operculum and between the prefrontal cortex and the somatosensory cortex. So that's the first time in our whole analysis stream that we find uh, something signaling uh, expectations. And then we also looked at uh, um, prediction error related effects. And it's also the first time that we find something related to mismatches of expectation sensory evidence prediction errors. And that we find particularly here in the gamma frequency range. So that we can conclude that expectations and prediction errors are, or uh, pre uh, expectation and prediction error effects in the processing of pain are related to uh, connectivity changes at alpha and gamma frequencies respectively. And the next question is then, if we find something uh, related to connectivity uh, or connectivity effects related to expectations, what might be the direction of the connectivity? We found uh, in particular uh, connectivity effects between the prefrontal cortex and the somatosensory cortex. And when analyzing the direction of this connectivity, it turns out that uh, or we found strong evidence in favor of connectivity from the prefrontal cortex to the somatosensory cortex in the alpha frequency band. So obviously top-down uh, uh, connectivity from the prefrontal cortex to somatosensory cortex is the phenomenon, the EEG phenomenon, which mediates um, expectation effects uh, on pain. Um, and uh, the intensity effects are not so important here in this um, context. So let's summarize this uh, second part of our analysis. What we found was that sensory information shapes local brain activity obviously more than interregional connectivity. In contrast, and vice versa, we found that expectations and prediction errors shape interregional connectivity more than local brain activity. So a kind of dissociation between the signaling of sensory information on the one hand, regional brain activity, and expectations and prediction errors on the other hand, interregional connectivity. Uh, and uh, when we look uh, in more detail, at more detail uh, at these connectivity patterns, we find that in particular prefrontal somatosensory connectivity at alpha frequencies is involved in signaling um, uh, um, expectation effects on pain, whereas prediction error effects are primarily signaled at connecti by connectivity at gamma frequencies. So far about some recent insights. That's interesting uh, to know, but what could we do to bring this type of information, this type of research a bit closer to clinical applications, uh, to treatment, uh, um, or to relevance for treatment? And I will now finalize uh, the talk with a few slides on uh, a very subjective selection, um, a few ideas about the future of EEG research related to expectation effects in particular, but also uh, maybe to EEG uh, in more uh, in neuroscience in more general. So the first step, and we discussed that now already for many years, is that we need more para or new paradigms which are ecologically more valid, is my opinion. And uh, when looking into the literature, uh, you find here a first study 
um, investigating expectation effects on um, uh, or related to pain on longer lasting pain on the state of chronic pain, which has been published more than 10 years ago. I think the results are not so important here, but the idea is already around quite a while. But we should, I think, definitely speed up um, uh, defining new paradigms. And I know that in your CRC, you are also uh, working on such uh, chronic, chronic, ecologically more valid paradigms. But it's not only about uh, finding new workflows, uh, new paradigms. We should also think about new workflows uh, related to EEG research. And we are currently working on such a workflow which aims at um, a large scale objective uh, um, uh, or large scale acquisition of EEG data and analyzing them in an objective and standardized uh, way. We should definitely aim to uh, record larger populations of patients. And to do that, uh, I think, Technological progress uh, facilitates uh, that uh, recording of large populations. There are new devices around, and this here is a review published earlier this year showing a selection of new EEG devices and uh, mobile EEG devices, which allow for more flexible, ecologically valid uh, recordings. And uh, they are already available. And we have also recently bought such a system, this one here, and we are quite happy with that. So we have now more flexible uh, systems for mobile use. And they are not only more flexible, but which is particularly important in a clinical context, they are much faster than previous EEG recordings. That's another review also published this year here on these new EEG devices also using dry EEG electrodes that uh, reduces significantly uh, preparation time. Here in blue, you see preparation times of traditional EEG um, systems as compared to preparation times of newer EEG systems. And you all know that in the clinical context, time is crucial. So they are faster and they are um, uh, even more comfortable for the participants and uh, the patients than the traditional EEG systems. So they, uh, we can uh, use these systems which are more flexible, faster, and more comfortable. But the crucial question is, what about the quality of the data? And also taken from this recent review here, and even when you take into account maybe a certain bias in this publication, or not only this, but many publications on these new EG systems, but it looks at least convincing that the quality of the data is not substantially different from the traditional systems, at least uh, for standard applications. And that's also our own experience. So they are available, they are fast, they are comfortable, and uh, the data quality is quite good. Next step would be uh, to bring our data in a standardized data structure. The fMRI world is far ahead. Uh, there, uh, uh, this is really the standard now, but in the EEG world, a standardized data structure has only been published uh, now four years ago. And uh, you, only the minority of studies so far uses this data structure, which allows for sharing data uh, and integrating data across sites. So I think we should use uh, that. And you will find in EEG publications that pre-processing of EEG data and also analysis, analysis of EEG data is in most cases highly subjective and not very transparent. So what is needed is really an automated uh, workflow, which allows for fully transparent, reproducible, standardized analysis, and also time-efficient analysis, 
when you aim at higher patient numbers. So for that reason, uh, we have uh, recently established uh, such an EEG pipeline. Here, Christina Gillavilla, a very gifted engineer, uh, PhD student for my group, has worked on that um, to establish such a automatic EEG uh, pipeline. And uh, we are lucky that this pipeline has been published exactly yesterday. And uh, it not only allows for standardized pre-processing, but also uh, for a standardized and fully automatic analysis of EEG data. So uh, not only uh, analyzing standard parameters such as peak frequencies or power of oscillations in certain brain areas, but all particularly allowing for analyzing connectivity and network measures which are, in our case here, when we think about expectations that we have learned from our previous studies, are particularly important to look at connectivity measures. And this toolbox here also includes um, objective assessment of connectivity measures. And we are not claiming that this is the ideal or ultimate way to analyze EEG data, but it is intended to represent an offer to the community to speed up uh, EEG research and the development of clinically or uh, useful information and uh, biomarkers. So this should be next step, connectivity analysis, particularly promising. Uh, there are examples from psychiatry, for example, where they already found uh, very promising connectivity pattern-based biomarkers of uh, treatment um, uh, success in uh, depression. And uh, my last step is that we have to, I think, reconsider our behavioral outcome measures, our clinical assessment so far. We all live in our little chronic pain silo or depression silo or PTSD silo or so, and we love our different scales and our philosophies uh, behind catastrophizing or self-efficacy or whatever. Uh, but that does not allow for integrating uh, data across disorders and checking for specificity of uh, our findings. And I, a while ago, came across this uh, here, uh, um, the cross-disorder clinical assessment tool termed PROMISE, funded by the NIH, probably some of you or many of you are already familiar with that. Uh, and I'm uh, not claiming that we all should use uh, this particular measure, but we should, I think, really rethink uh, our clinical assessments and make that interoperable across uh, disorders, the clinical assessment. So, uh, and uh, finally, we should, and that's uh, also not a new idea, integrate our assessments across the different methods, uh, not only our biological uh, assessments, but also our psychological assessments and uh, possibly many other assessments. And we should do that in an open and reproducible uh, way. Um, uh, this review published last year uh, provides a nice overview uh, of uh, um, current research practices furthering open and reproducible research. I find that extremely helpful. If you stick to all these practices, you will probably perform one study in your life. So you have to find a balance uh, to um, um, to use these practices, but this is ex uh, here a nice collection of possible uh, tools which I found helpful. And I'm increasingly bored to read and perform studies uh, which are not reproducible. And I think we should invest a bit more in uh, these practices. And I know that many of you are also uh, sharing that opinion. So uh, that brings me to the final uh, summary slide. What have we learned about expectation effects? We have learned that 
the brain mechanisms serving expectation effects on pain fundamentally differ from those serving sensory effects on pain. And we have particularly learned that expectation effects or uh, expectations shape interregional connectivity more than local brain activity. And uh, they are particularly mediated by interregional prefrontal somatosensory uh, connectivity at alpha frequencies. And that means when we think about clinical conditions, chronic conditions, chronic pain conditions possibly, which are increasingly over time, increasingly detached from sensory information, but increasingly shaped by contextual information and expectations, particularly in these chronic conditions, connectivity is, uh, I think, uh, the, the most promising parameter to gain further insights into these processes. And finally, I would like to thank my research group. Uh, I'm very happy with this uh, nice research group, uh, multidisciplinary, including engineers, data scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, and medical doctors. Um, and uh, yeah, I thank uh, the uh, funding agencies and I thank you for your time and attention. 